I had read Becker and uh, was very impressed when I was working in psychology today and they pretty well let me interview who I wanted. I said, we ought to interview Ernest Becker. And somebody said, well, you know, he's sick, he's terminal. I said, oh my God, we better interview him. So I called up and, um, and his wife Maria asked him if he, wanted, if he wanted to be interviewed. He was in the hospital, they expected him to live only a matter of days. He said, yes, he really, he really did, because he had not received the recognition that he deserved. Uh, and he, you know, he felt the importance of his ideas. This was a vocation. This was a man who lived with his ideas. And so I, uh, I spent, I think, the weekend preparing the interview, like you've prepared the interview with me, getting all the questions, and I, I went up there. So I walked into the room. It was in the hospital in, uh, I think it was Simon Fraser Hospital in, in Vancouver. I forget the name of the hospital. But I walked in the room. He's lying in the bed. And he, he just, without any, anything else, he just said, well, uh, you'll have a chance to see whether I live as, a, uh, as I thought. You see me in extremis and see whether if, how, something like how a philosopher dies. Those weren't the exact words, but they were, that, was the, that was the whole thing. And um, so we started. We started in the thing. And, um, and it was an amazing morning. I started in the morning because uh, we got deeper and deeper into it. He had gone without much medicine. He told me that so that he could be clear. And uh, we talked and it was wonderful because, you know, death was banished from the room. It was very moving because, you know, as we got into the passion of this, there was the ideas and the things and the, the, the immortal, uh, unchangeable, Becker and his ideas was there, you know, and death was pushed out. There was no, there was no room for death in this, you know, in this, in this room. And so he got tired, and uh, so I went away for lunch for two, three hours, and um, came back, and uh, Maria and his and his two kids were there, and he was talking to them, you know, you you, giving them a pep talk, you know, you you, I want you to be. Uh, doctors or lawyers, you know, he, he, he wanted them, you know, to, to, to do something out and give them that kind of a sort of moral instructions. And then they left and um, we continued to talk, talk into, into the afternoon, it was a rainy afternoon. And, uh, and, um, and finally, finally, you know, it was just time to end. And uh, so he had, they had been giving him a little, they'd given him giving some brandy or something to, in, in the cups, and he hadn't drunken most of it, so I just took this brandy, we poured in these two little paper cups and sort of... had a toast. It still affects me. He's a beautiful man. He died at 49, and you know, it was... it was all of our... All of our tragic deaths that he, that, you know, we all. And um, I went home and I wrote the interview and I just wrote it uh, straight. I didn't do anything except cut a few things out and sent it back to him. And uh, and he lived another month and a half. He wanted to see this interview published, you know, because it meant it was a national thing. For Psychology Day in those days was a, a large um prestigious magazine and uh, uh, he died I think on Friday and it came out on Monday or something. So you know, it was very moving. I've never ceased to be moved by that and that was what, 20 something, 30 years ago was it? It was just, just as alive as it was. As he was a man who, who, who thought with his everything in him, everything in him. There was nothing, there was none of the dilettante in him. There was none of the uh, there was none of the academic game player. There was nothing of the academic in that removed sense of the word. Man, he, he thought with his life. You're one of the great ones.